I'd like to start so generally as just asking you to tell me what you're interested in now. So my interest now is the big problem we face. Um, I think as so many people, uh, I feel we face really huge problems environmentally and mm. socially. And I spend most of my time grappling with what business can do. And clearly there's a lot that could happen politically. I'm a huge fan of a price for carbon and a price for water, and I think it would make a huge difference. But my immediate focus is what can we do as business people? And in thinking about that question, I really go in two directions, and I'm trying to make them one direction. So the first direction is a sort of good, old-fashioned, mainstream, there's money to be made here. And that, I think, is very important and very worthwhile. So as we think about the crisis in water, or the coming crisis in agriculture, or the new clean tech we need to develop to deal with the energy, or with the energy crisis, or reducing energy use in our buildings, there's all kinds of opportunities for new business. So I spend a great deal of my time, and a lot of us here at Harvard spend a lot of our time telling students about these opportunities, um, exploring the business model that one can use to make money from these, from these opportunities, and that's really important. It takes a lot of my time. The second thing I spend a lot of time thinking about is the fact that as business people, we dress in suits and we're very rational and we talk about numbers. And yet those of us who are thinking about the environmental issues we face are often really motivated by a deep sense of values, moral outrage, a sense of, what do you mean my grandchildren are not going to see half the bird species? Now, what do you mean that sea level rise is going to displace hundreds of millions of people? That's not okay. And what I'm really interested in at the moment is how one begins to bring some of that sense of values-based action into a business context in such a way that it doesn't become fanatical, that it doesn't shut down appropriate conversation, that it's still playing by the legitimate rules of business. That is, how do we think about building a business, a firm, more broadly a system, where I can bring my whole self to work without feeling as if I'm a fool or a, an unrealistic romantic, right? And how do I do that in a way that means I'm still a hard-headed business person? It, it, it's such an interesting and hard question. Because if you think about where business comes from, how did we get business that was so leached of any sense of values or purpose or who you are as a person? We got that way because, horrible generalization, a hundred years ago, Bringing my values to work meant me telling you what to do. Only I would have been white and male and you would have been, you know, black or whatever. And one of the great achievements of 19th century society and of the modern corporation is everyone's treated equally. I don't impose my values on you. We play by procedural ration rationality, which means I don't give jobs to the boys. So the firms we've created, the capitalism we've created is an achievement. The decoupling from the society in which we were in was a good thing and led to enormous individual freedom and incredible prosperity. And that prosperity supported political um, openness and, and really sort of underlay a lot of what's happened. But now we're looking at a world where to have our work lives decoupled from our fundamental beliefs is, is going to lead to trouble. Right? If as a business person I'm running a big utility and I can say, well, you know, the shareholders need the bottom line and I can't, I really have to build the next coal plant, there's something wrong. Right? And we don't want business people making policy. I'm very clear on that. Policy comes from the, from the civil society. But on the other hand, what can business people do to bring those values to work? And I've become really, really interested in two things. One is the so-called purpose-driven firm, and is that a real thing? Or is it that there are a few firms in a few niches in the economy which have consumers who will pay a bit extra, and we have these incredible leaders, 
and I'm thinking here of, of, of a firm like Patagonia, right? An amazing CEO, fantastic product line. Can it be generalized to the whole economy? I don't know. I'm not convinced, right? Um, and so is the purpose-driven company just a way of talking about a particularly charismatic leader who happens to be in a situation where you can run the firm and talk about values, but by the way, make a lot of money at the same time? Or is it the case that it's really a different way to run a firm? That if we invite people to share their own commitments, if we create shared commitments as an organization, if instead of focusing only on shareholder return, we cast a broader net and think about the whole system, will that also make us better business people mm. in the sense of seeing different kinds of opportunities, um, building reputations, understanding our customers in a different way, engaging employees in a different way? Is that indeed a different way to run a railroad? And the evidence on this is really mixed. I mean, the research is all over the place. There's this deep finding in the research that there are some firms that are much more productive than others. Not 10%, but 200%. Mm. And there's this intuition in the literature that it's something about employee engagement and something about learning, but it's hard to nail down. And so a bunch of my research is about Don't Laugh trying to write mathematical models of why this kind of long-term commitment might really make a difference trying to be systematically rigorous about why not always being systematically rigorous could be business good business practice so using more subjective measures not always using short-term measures why would that help you to run a better firm and so that's a big part of what i do as an academic i think it's really important because we have a deeply embedded ideology that price is all that matters, that individuals work only for money, that we can fundamentally measure people just by numbers and just by short-term numbers. And I've never met a serious business person who actually believes all of this, but I've met firms that are run this way. And I think what's difficult is that in the short term, in some places, that's a very good way to run a firm. And in particular, if you're burning up natural capital, and social capital. You don't have to think about the long term and you don't have to ask these broader questions and you get very rich. And so how do we develop a rigorous model or an, if rigorous is such an academics word, how do we develop a plausible model that people can see that I'm not just being a romantic, you know, romantic visionary, actually I could run a firm and make money and have fun and make a difference to the community I'm in. And that could be not an exceptional thing. I don't have to be this amazing person, but you know, we could all do that. We could run our economy like that. So that's part of what I'm trying to, to do is be part of that broad movement. And then the other thing I spend a lot of time doing is really trying to think and help business people think and join with my colleagues in thinking about what is the relationship between business and the society in which we're embedded because it's so easy to say, well, over here is the business world and government should come from the civil society and I don't mess with it. And yet we live in a world in which business is interacting with government all the time, lobbying for regulation, funding candidates. How do we talk about the fact that business people are responsible, at least partly responsible, for the institutions by which we live? And how does one talk about that in a way such that it has some bite? Mm. Because, you know, if you're a business person, I can talk to you and you can say, well, yeah, Rebecca, you're right. And yes, I wish our political process was more functional and I wish we had a carbon tax, but what can I do, right? I have to firm to run. And so this question of can firms at the leading edge, by setting an example, begin to drive institutional change? Can firms working together, whether in supply chains or um, in other forms of industry association, say, no, we are going to act as if we don't just meet the local minimum acceptable standard. We go one step beyond that. Mm. Can we find a way that business begins to support the kind of governance we need for a sustainable world? And that's, I mean, talk about a quixotic conversation, right? That's really hard. But I think that's another conversation we need to have, and it's part of what the sociologists have been talking about for over 100 years, 
which is the re-embedding of economic life in our real lives, our social lives. And so if as managers we bring our values and our commitments to work, not just within the firm, but also beyond the firm boundaries, what might that look like? And so that, that's what I'm thinking about at the moment. That's quite a lot.